Hey Gooners, this is Alan Smith. This is Kevin Campbell. Lee Dixon. It's Colin Lewin. It's Gary Lewin. Charles Watts. Dan Potts. James Benj. Stanley. Tom from the Gooners Talk here. Ryan Oakhurst. Simon Collings. You may know me from the Evening Standard. You may know me from my time at Arsenal. You may know me from Arsenal or even the Hybrid Squad. I'm a bird cat one land. Being that physio set on the bench next to Arsenal with my rubber gloves on. The former Arsenal physio. The Emirates press box from writing, from Twitter. From goal.com, from Twitter, from YouTube. Football is the beautiful game and it brings us all together. Sometimes there are things even more important than wins and losses. And yes, even transfers. Every 30 seconds someone in this world gets diagnosed with blood cancer. The Leukaemia and Lymphoma Society works towards curing blood cancers and provide support to families currently dealing with these diseases. Gunas vs Cancer was started in 2017 by a lifelong Guna who lost his father to leukaemia way too young. Since 2017, Gunas v Cancer has raised over $75,000 for the Leukaemia and Lymphoma Society. And we need your help to keep the fundraising going in this year's campaign. Every donation helps. Every donation helps. Every donation helps. Every donation helps. No matter the size. And every donation enters you into the Guna raffle. Well, you have a great chance to win amazing Arsenal prizes, including game tickets, stadium tours, signed men and women's shirts. And maybe a retro signed shirt by yours truly, Lee Dixon. Me, yours truly. Yours truly. Super kick camp. So much more. It's easy to take part. Just go to www.gunasvcancer.com and donate directly to the charity. Pick the raffle prizes you want to enter to win and wait for the drawings at the end of the campaign. Again, that's www.gunasvcancer.com. We all know that victory grows out of harmony. Victory grows out of harmony. Victory grows out of harmony. With your help, we'll be victorious against blood cancer once and for all. Thank you for your support. Thank you for your support. Thank you for your support. Thanks for your support. Thanks for your support. Thank you for your support. Okay, we are entering our number, what is it, 9, 10, 11, 12, uh, I believe this is. And, um, and we're going strong. So joining us today, I am very, very happy to have two gentlemen who uh, team together to look at football in a slightly different way. And uh, one of them I've met, one of them I'm meeting for the first time now. So we'll start with uh, with Scott. Good to see you, Scott. Yeah, how are you doing, Mike? I am doing fantastic. I'm, I'm feeling better than I thought I would. I haven't, needed, got lots to of energy. haven't needed to dip into the to the energy drinks yet. So uh, yet. see it coming pretty soon, though. And, and, and we also have Adam Ray Vogue. Adam, it's so nice to finally put a face to a name. Hey, Mike, good to see you. And as I like to say, yeehaw. Yeehaw. All right. That sounds good. And and uh, right, let, Scott, let's do this. Let's <laughs> let's do this. We, we talk we're talking about practice. Um so uh let's see. Where where's my uh my introduction here? First up, a man who I'm finally meeting for the first time. We've com- we've communicated on Twitter, most famously in the middle of an argument that he was having with Aston about uh Karen Tierney and his market value. Winning. Uh, when our own Aston referred to us having had a financial expert on the pod meaning Kieran Maguire, and Adam posts a picture of me saying, with all due respect to Mike. <laughs> so that's my favorite tweet. That was very funny. And uh, it's Adam Ray Vogue. What's up, man? How much? Just coming at you live from a house full of sleeping people because it's 11 p.m. where I am. So, yeah, well, I'm wired. Well, that's good. And uh, we're, my goal is to see some young child walk behind you and go, Daddy, I'm sleeping. Um, I, I mean, which would be even weirder if they're not one of your kids. Um, and of course, the other half of Canon Stat, a guy uh, Andy Rhodes is allergic to because he's covered in crab cakes. Uh, he's got the joint highest XG and the punching above their weight with their depart uh, with their wife department, along with me. Yeah, you you can say that she's a real person. You've met her. She is. I, she's she's legit. She's not. Uh, you know, she's not a pretend. Uh, you know, person that you created online. Uh, it's someone who's had a crash course in the last six months of what being at a pub with me is all about. And I think he still likes me. It's Scott Willis. Yeah, I, I do enjoy. Yeah, you're a fun person to hang out with. And I would gladly given the chance to do it again. Well, we will have that chance, I'm sure. And we will do it again. So a um, couple quick uh, housekeeping items. We are uh, we are collecting money. 
that is going, we're actually not even collecting it. We're asking you to send it directly through GunnersVCancer.com to the Leukemia Lymphoma Society. Um, and we have raised this year, starting in the middle of July, over $25,555 for the Leukemia Lymphoma Society, which I am absolutely thrilled about. Um, since we started collecting for this specific event, the, the Podathon, we have raised $10,000. $255. And so uh, thank you to everybody that's donated. Uh, donations are slowing a little bit. I think that might have something to do with the time of night that it is in various places and the fact that we've already gotten so many great donations. But if you haven't yet, please do consider tuning in uh, for the rest of the podcast and also going to GoonersVCancer.com. Um, if you have questions that you would like to ask Adam and or Scott anytime throughout the hour, please put them in the chat. We'll uh, we'll mark them and we'll ask them a little bit later on. I, one of us has a little bit of an echo. It sounds like a, a police scanner, but I think it's my own voice. Um, but we'll we'll move past that. And um, and, and so I love stat. Believe it or not, I love stat. I grew up as a math nerd. I mean, I, I was I took algebra at twelve. Trig at 14, calculus at 15. And then for some reason I got to college and it, you know, it became about business and finance and, you know, the ladies. Uh, so somewhere along the line, the world of statistics zoomed so far past what I was accustomed to at the time with, you know, RBI and, and uh, you know, uh, yards per catch and that sort of thing that I just stopped trying to keep up which is why I love having you guys on because, you know, keeping us straight about what we're seeing what's you know how we should be looking at things compared to to the eye test as a supplement so there's a lot you see in the main cameras coverage of a game and a lot you don't see but stats cats a lot of this so my first question is do you given the way that you approach football statistics and statistics in general do you do you think you watch games live differently than most people do or do you watch kind of with a disconnect to the stats and then collect the information and, and kind of review them in a more contextual stat, uh, contextual way, Adam. It's a great question. I think I think I watch um, Arsenal specifically differently. I think that uh, contrary to what a lot of my my bigger haters on the uh, on Twitter might think, um, I think when I watch games that I don't have an emotional attachment to, I actually would probably lean really heavily toward the eye test. Um, which is probably would surprise a lot of people. Um, but then I, you know, I tend to really like review, uh, kind of like go over the box scores from back in the day, right? Like see what, uh, if my eyes are matching kind of what is getting spit out after the game. So, um, yeah, I mean, and that those two kind of, kind of things are always in tension with each other. And I think that just helps you create kind of a more holistic viewpoint about what just happened. Yeah, that's interesting. Scott, would you say the same thing? I mean, how do you how do you consume football when it's live and it's coming into your face for the very first time? Um, so typically my first uh, watching of the game is more emotional. Um, so I, I typically will watch the game twice. Um, and I've, I've actually uh, started publishing all my notes that I actually take during a game um, because I am a, a big fat nerd that I, I write all my notes that I, you know, the minutes that things happen, um, things for me to want to come back to and um, especially when I'm uh, having to write about the game afterwards. So that's something that, that really helps me, um, especially when I'm watching on the, the second time, when that's when I get my, my cold, rational uh, stats nerd stuff on, um, you know, taking screenshots and, uh, you know, doing little clips and doing those kinds of things. But usually on the first time, I am a lot more emotional. Um, there, there's times where I feel like I need to hide behind the couch. Um, you know, I need to do the, the classic, you know, the gold bridge where I'm hiding behind my chair. Um, I'm scared of everything that happens. So I think that is something that that definitely happens with me. Um, there's sometimes when I'm watching other teams where I can be, uh, you know, kind of turn it off and do those kinds of things. But yeah, I absolutely um, will will definitely get emotional about games um, when I when I go to like a pub or something like that because I've I've done that on a handful of times. Um, I I totally turn off everything and I just go like as a fan and do that kind of thing. Um, when I was at the the game uh, in London. Um, I can barely remember the game, um, partly because I, I drink a little bit too much. Um, yes. But um, it was a lot more as a fan. I did not do any stats or anything like that. So um, it, it's interesting. Yeah. So the first time, a lot more emotional. Second time, cold, rational. Yeah. You know, and and it, it seems to kind of be the, 
you know, and, and that's because the trendsetters, uh, Arsenal Vision, have uh, have kind of made it this way. But the rewatch of the game, I wish I had time to do that. Uh, but you know, and I'm I not watch trying it on to... one and a half speed, and that really helps me. Um, the, to, to squeeze it in like um, the, the yeah, same so way we listen to the podcast. Um, yeah, well, I, I listen on double speed. <laughs> so when I actually talk with people in real life, I'm like, why aren't you talking incredibly fast? Um, which is actually, if you actually talk with Elliot, like he does talk fast. Yeah, he um, talks in double speed. So if you listen to that in double speed, it's like, <laughs> yeah. But uh, I don't know. Uh, people uh, on the West Coast talk fast, and so that's something that I'm, I'm used to. And um, people have told me that I need to slow down sometimes when I'm talking. So. I don't know. I like that. My brain processes things fast, I guess. Yeah, but the, the rewatch is it's it's really just such a great idea because you 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 know you you form your opinion, you sprinkle in a little bit of of crowdsourcing of other people's opinions, and then you know that for me it generally stops there. Um, you know, so you either kind of hunker down and say, well, I don't believe what they're saying, or, you know, maybe in some cases, especially when there's drinking at a bar, um, you know, and, and you've just kind of got this dulling of, of, of remembering every little thing that happened during the game. Like, like for me with the Fulham game, I, I, you know, I, I was living and dying with every kick, but I couldn't really tell you what happened in most of the game. Cause we were at a pub. Uh, but the, uh, you know, the, the, the rewatch just it really allows you to kind of reconcile them and bring them back together again and then of course you you take it to another level where you start to compile information about it and 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 that further can guide you now i'm going to put this up on the screen i'm going to want you to explain it to us and this is this is um you know this is is getting involved the, the, with, with debate there's been some debate caused by this graphic compliments of canon stats the first part of the debate is, should people really credit the creditor of things when they post them as their own? Uh, <laughs> I, I, I love how uh, when people get pulled up on, on taking people's content without crediting them. But I think so this we have not spent very much of this podcast, believe it or not, in 11 and plus hours talking about Kai Havertz. So, yeah, and I apologize, uh, Scott, if you if you move to your left a little bit. Um, <laughs> so what? is this meant to represent um and uh how sh how should we read this as far as you know is this is this essentially telling us slow down on the cut and the anti kai havertz uh narrative or is this up for interpretation explain well, it to what, me like i'm five well, well one thing like at this point of the season like it's it's way way too early to make any sort of concrete you know salute or you know uh decision on a player um he's only you know played what just just under four 90s with the team so it's that's something that already is hard to say um I, I made this and i've been posting them kind of weekly because it feels like things are out of whack um with the the overall perception of kai havertz um and what he's been doing with the team um i don't think he's been amazing by any stretch of the imagination or anything like that but i think he's been fine um, I know my other, it is actually to my right. Um, when I moved this way, um, not my left, it's left well, move, on move in one direction weird. and then we'll tell you whether it's the right direction or not, because we, I would love to see you while you're talking. <laughs> um, I think so it's I, to your left, but, but, uh, I went to my the, right. Yeah. So when so I, when I he make, wants to go to his left, then. so I, I, I move this, then I'm, yeah, there, there you is. go. <laughs> Um, so when, I, when I'm looking at this, um, so I, this is uh, the midfield template. Um, so this is comparing the stats um, on a per 90 basis to other players that have played um, you know, over the last, I think it goes back to the 2015-2016 the season um, in the big five leagues of Europe. So that's the, the basis for the comparison. So these are players that are midfielders um, or at least line up in midfield positions. Um, you know, it's a debatable, has Kai Howard's actually even played? as a midfielder here, um, or is he more of a, a second striker, uh, auxiliary attacker? Um, positions are always hard and uh, malleable with how people kind of pick things. So that's the, the first part that makes it hard to be able to make these comparisons. But then the second one here, you know, kind of looking at it, it's uh, these are what, what I'd kind of consider um, key stats that I would kind of look at. So you have the, the upper portion is the attacking metric. So you're looking at shots, you're looking at um, expected goals, you're looking at uh, creating for your teammates. So you're looking at uh, XA, key passes, being able to, <laughs> to get passes into the penalty area. Um, and then you go, you start getting more into the ball progression stats. So being involved in build up, that's your XG build up. 
uh, passing efficiency. So that's your, your actual passing compared to your expected passing, uh, progressive passes, passes into the final third, progressive carries. Um, so you, it's just a, a, a trying to figure out the, the things that you want to see from midfielder and seeing where they're excelling. Um, I think it's interesting to see um, the overlap um, between Jacka and Havertz. The, they, they're playing a similar role, and I think they're playing it at a, a pretty similar level with maybe Kai Havertz doing a little bit better in the attack. Um, Granit Xhaka doing a little bit better in some of the ball progression metrics. Um, and I think that matches how you would expect to see from the two players. Um, I think one of the things that's been the biggest surprise for me is Kai Havertz's defensive um, output, being able to do those kinds of things. I had that question mark coming in. Was he going to be able to do it, stepping up more as a forward um, at his time as Chelsea? He hadn't really played midfield since his time in the Germany. Um, so I think that's been a, a really positive thing. Um, so I wouldn't say that this is a conclusive um, like answer to has Kai Havertz been uh, a bust or anything like that, but I think it does kind of put a little bit of uh, context that the performances haven't been as bad as perhaps some of the narrative. Yeah, and and I that's that's exactly what you just said is exactly is exactly what I took from this. But uh, I mean, you know, and and it is the sample size. This is what thirty eight games for Granite Jaka or or over. Yes, yeah, so it was over, uh, yeah thirty three point six ninety. So uh, a okay, real yeah. good full season against four games from from Kai Havertz. Or does it include pre? I mean, I, I, this is this is, this is just the Premier League so far. So um, okay. um, as he gets more minutes, um, I'll, you know, if we get some uh, Champions League stuff, I'll consider throwing that in there. But it, um, I like to go Premier League to Premier League. Okay, for my well, personal thought. Can you I ask your first Kai Havertz winning the Ballon d'Or next year? <laughs> you heard it here um, first. Uh, I'll, I'll ask the question to Adam just because I'm curious because I I am like the most I'm gonna say. I, I was going to say anti-stat guy, but that makes it seem like I disregard them completely. My, my co-host and the other podcast that I do have been slowly dragging me in to, to focus more on things like XG, chance creation, all that. Has there ever been a case for any of you two in which what your eyes see does not match up according to the stats that you that you end up seeing at the end of the game? Like, the, Does the emotions ever get back to you and you're like, okay, Kai Havertz created this many chances – God, I think he had a superb game. So, but the stats may not reflect, or vice versa, the other way around. That's a tough question. Um, you know, I think a little. Some of the guys like me and Scott, who maybe are taking uh, taking a little bit more, a little bit less of a reactionary approach to this. Um, I know I certainly don't. Uh, go right and dive into the stats completely right after the game. Uh, usually I'm waiting until like FB ref is posting their recap to really look at it. Um, so I've kind of cooled down by then a lot of the time. I think that uh, if if I had to like go off of just memory, I think one of the things I would, I would probably think of is like particularly direct attackers. There have been definitely been times when I felt like those guys have wreaked like complete havoc, um, on their opponent. And then you go to the, the stat recap the next day and you see like this guy's been dispossessed five times during the game. He was two for eight on dribbles or something like that. So uh, you, I think really like, you know, ever since I've been posting my very first threads on Twitter, I've been saying uh, something along the lines of like, in my disclaimer, this is only stats. Uh, you should always oh, yeah. combine it right with the eye test because there are things that just aren't showing up. Um, a winger can completely terrorize a, a fullback and be neutralized according to that fullback's uh, fans, right? We saw that on Twitter this week with uh, Dallo and um, I, who was the other fullback? I don't even care. Juan Basaka neutralizing Saka and Martinelli. Um, and that to anyone who watched the game clearly was not what happened, but I think they used some numbers to justify that, right? So I feel like that's where, that's where I feel like I've seen it the most. Um, with those like really direct forwards, but um, yeah, I don't know. I don't know, is Scott. It, you have an idea. Yeah, I, I am Did learning to remember how far Dallo could could like uh, his average slide, like like how many hundred <laughs> meters. Yeah, I was gonna say I am learning to appreciate some underlying stats, and most most of it has started coming from not only not only the defense of um, Kai Havers, but I started doing it with Shaka a little bit more with what he was providing. And Udegaard, I think he just had an interview while he was away in an international break where he was saying that sometimes he could feel like he played horrible, but score a goal or a, provide an assist. And fans are like, this is the greatest ball on the future winner ever. Right. And sometimes he's like, 
I wasn't even heavily involved in a goal or an assist, and I feel like I played superb. So it's always nice, a nice fine balance. I think uh, there was a brilliant comment in there. Set, you moved me up right there. Stats are a tool, not a conclusion. It's all part of a mix, and I think that's mm-hmm. a really fair way of viewing this. I, uh, you know, when you guys post stats, again, somebody that is vibe FC, as I like to refer to myself. Sometimes I'm like, I don't agree with that because I, I, I you know, we we smashed it. But I mean, they're hard numbers, right? You guys aren't making them up. So sometimes the the vibe check that I have because of my fan hype almost rejects certain stats. And it's it's a difficult blend to have. So props well, to you guys for being able to continue to enjoy the game of football, which is insanely passionate at times, and still be able to detach yourself and kind of analyze some numbers. I think that's a, that's a skill level that you have to have. I mean, with, 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 with anything, I mean, if you're inclined to be binary, if you're inclined to think it's Arteta in or Arteta out, or, you know, this is bad, this is good, then, you know, you're going to look at stats and say, I, I don't, I mean, th- those are going to be the people that just disregard completely the value of stats because you're going to take them as something that is, a, is an attempt to drive a narrative rather than just add additional context. I mean, my favorite two words in in dealing with people's emotions surrounding football are context and nuance. And there's so many people that miss both of those and that just cannot grasp the fact that, you know, that like, you know, if you're pushing a golf ball around the ground, you push it a little bit and you push it that direction and you push it that direction. It isn't just smacking it this way or smacking it that way. It's a, it's a titration of of your feelings. At least I feel it should be, which is why. You know, and when you have that, you tend to build more patience into your into your life. You tend to build more tolerance in. You tend to be less of an asshole. Um, you know, I think in in scientific terms, and and uh, you know, and 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 ultimately, whether you're proven wrong or proven right, is 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 less divisive to people in that situation. But one of the things, you know, as there are certain statistics in sports and in in life that are one hundred percent completely objective. Um, shooting percentage in basketball. Um, You know, you either make or miss a shot. Um, RBIs uh, or your batting percentage, the number of times you get a hit, although that there are elements of that that could be subjective, whether it's a hit or an error or so on. And that's kind of what I'm getting at. Um, With all of these advanced stats, dribbled past, dual, duels won. Um, Who is the arbiter is there a website? Is there a person? Is it is it something that you can get different results from one person to the next? Who is the arbiter of what some of those maybe more subjective statistics, you know, of, of, of what those outcomes are? Um, so, yeah, there's actually a, a really great article um, on the old 538 website um, uh, where they did a, a lot more of their sports stuff and where they, I think they go into a lot more in-depth um, of the the day-by-day uh, stringing of the stats stuff. So um, most of the stats that you'll see are provided by Opta or Stats Perform. So that's the, the main um, uh, company that provides a lot of statistics. And their method is they have two, pl- um, two people um, that will watch the game. Um, they have a special um, tactical feed that they're able to use. And um, each one is responsible for one team. And they record literally every action on the pitch. And that is what makes up the event data that happens. Um, so they have certain metric or, you know, certain like kind of a rubric that helps them to make determinations on um, the definitions for things. Because, yeah, even like in inside the game, you know, what is a tackle? Um, what is, you know, those kinds of things like it's it's not perfectly black and white. Um, so you have to make these calls. Um, so these people have all been trained to be able to do these kinds of things. Um, and then there is an audit process that happens after the game where they go through it. Um, a lot of the companies now are adding in um, computer vision to be able to help these kinds of things. So I think that was one of the things that StatsBomb really pioneered was being able to bring in um, computer vision to be able to help their people um, to be able to um, analyze games faster at a higher detail because they record even more events than what happens um, with the Opta. Um, Opta also bought a company that they also now, I think it's um, Sports Spectrum. I'm trying to remember the exact company name, Um, but they did um, stuff with uh, basketball uh, tracking. So now both of the companies are starting to get even further um, into tracking and being able to have an even finer detail inside of the the stats. So it's uh, a, a 
some of it is uh, very objective, right? It's a, you know, was there a shot? Was there not a shot? Like that's always, that's always easy. Usually easy to tell. Well, there, I, are, some, I, there are sometimes, right? Where it's like yeah, a cross shot. Not always. Yeah. Right. Is that. I have in the last game. I I'm of the opinion that that was just a really, really sneaky pass. Yeah. Maybe it was uh, <laughs> the key pass. Yep. Sneaky um, pass but th there's those kinds of things where it, there's some uh, gray zone to some of the things that happen, but generally um, I think everybody can agree on most of the, the items, um, but like everything in uh, this this crazy game of soccer, um, not everything is uh, fully agreed. Yeah, and and that's really where I was. What I was most interested in is when there is subjectivity. Is there a you know? And 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 then of course my business background kicks in. Like like who is like did someone is someone the the, the arbiter of the whole thing? And what makes them the arbiter? Is there a, is there going to be a competition? Is there going to be an opta competition that comes up and they want to be the arbiter? And you could end up with two different camps. Where, you know, oh, was Van Dyke dribbled past or was he not dribbled past? And then, you know, I could just see chaos breaking loose. Um, yeah, so I mean, there absolutely is going to be uh, disagreements between the different stats companies. So if you look at different ones, they'll have um, most of the time there'll, there'll be an agreement. But on these corner cases, there'll be um, things that will be slightly different. Um, so, yeah, it is uh, always interesting to see those kinds of things kind of go. But over a long part of the season, they generally will come closer together. Um, but, yeah, uh, on any one thing, it might be a little bit funky. When would you when would you say, Adam, that um, that this became huge in football? Like like when did we go from everyone just watched the football match and figured out how it went to you know, derivative uh, statistics that, that you know, mm -hmm. per 90 statistics and then derivatives and then derivatives of derivatives, which is kind of how it seems to me. It's almost like the financial markets where you create all these different securities out of other securities and analyze things in a different way. And then you try to find your system that is going to allow you to pick the right stock. And I, it's almost, you know, it, it feels almost the same way. But like, when did that boom happen? I think I, I really think that in kind of the fan communities were were kind of uh, in in the thick of it right now. Um, I know Scott and I were kind of uh, jointly, you know, moaning about this account that's popped up on Twitter that allows fans to go in and uh, request two players, and it spits out a chart for them, and it's just complete baloney. Um, but it, that's kind of uh, I saw a comment from someone. Who had like tagged tagged us in a reply that they had to somebody's comment and they call it the gamification of analytics and i think that's really uh that's a, a really good point of kind of where it's become where it's gone now i remember when i was first you know this is like 2020 2021 when i was first starting to get into like looking at scott's profile way back in the day and like getting inspiration for how to chart my own data and things like that i mean it was it was something that you had to do something you had to understand and and now it's getting to the point where we're really just like input what you want and and you're getting out your charts so i think it's only going to grow especially as it becomes more and more mainstream and um uh, as more and more people try to use charts like that to uh to make their arguments um you know on the team side i mean i i like couldn't tell you i feel like it's probably 2017 2018 is when it kind of started to really blow up i know arsenal were one of the first adopters i think in the premier league right scott can you back me up on that but that was probably more like early to mid 2000s was that due to stats dna was that something was that that uh yes yeah. i what i recall is stats dna being responsible for a lot of people who didn't quite work out at arsenal <laughs> wasn't he the reason we bought mustafi i, I don't think it was the the reason um <laughs> um i do think that we that, had the money to burn uh, we establish is better than Harry Maguire earlier on in the podcast. <laughs> yeah. um, I, I think he uh, he did pop on certain metrics. Um, so his passing was something that did look good um, in his profile. Um, and I still think that, you know, that actually matched my eye test. It was the, uh, the headless uh, decisions sometimes. Uh, that he didn't have any sort of sense of risk reward when he went into uh, duels. I think that was uh, Mustafi's biggest problem uh, for me uh, more than anything is that uh, he just absolutely uh, did some of the dumbest things um, in the worst situations, and he didn't need to do them. And uh, when you're a defender, that is a, a big, big problem to be able to have. You know, I, I, I'm sorry. Go ahead. I was just kind of curious because one thing that's made a lot is like we we Stop often stop putting that comment up. Yeah. I, I do I love, love back on I'm a, I'm a huge, huge first name. Mustafi, Mustafi fan club over here. Now, um, 
is there so we talk about stats and we i understand the value and and what percentage and passing and tackling and all that stuff going on is there any like and this is going to sound horrible because i'm about to bash other leagues almost like converter because we look the leagues are so vastly different and not only the play style but the levels and we you know we, we joke around a lot like lacazette went from doing nothing for us and scoring 20 plus goals in league one uh, Tanali, his talent seemingly are overlapping and doing well over here in the English Premier League. But we see so many players that, like Milan, right, currently with Pul- with Pul- Pulisic and uh, Adoy and Tammy wow, Hebraham with Roma, et cetera, et cetera. They go over there and they're superstars. They're, they're like, they're very well regarded in, in Italy. The fans love them. But you, you take a City A player over here and it doesn't always translate. So is there anything to kind of balance the perspective out of a player that like sub- scores 40 goal look yeah, we talked about pepe we, well we spoke about we, see, well we spoke about pepe earlier on right? he came to us being like a world beater in france and while he had not the ho- most horrible of time with the arsenal it didn't exactly translate and there's so many examples like that so is there any way to kind of balance that out or we were just relying on how those stats play out in whatever league they're playing. I think Scott and I both have pretty strong takes on this, right? I, I know, I know Scott and I are both believers in, in waiting uh, the, the raw stats that we're pulling from other leagues. Um, you know, I do, I do rate the premier league quite a bit higher than the other leagues. I generally, I put Spain and Italy next, but um, you know, I, I also do kind of like scouting film sessions for the site. And I mean, one thing that I'm always looking at is the traits that are actually transferable. So like when you're watching Nico Pepe in, in uh, France with Lille running into a lot of space, right? Running in behind the defense, how's that going to translate um, coming into the premier league? And, and I, you know, going back to January, I was saying this exact same thing about, about Mikhailo Mudrik. Uh, I was saying, Look at the look at the space between him and the defender. Look at look at the touch. It goes almost right to the defender who's yards away from him. That's not going to happen in the Premier League, and people would get so mad at me on Twitter. But it was the truth. Uh, so I'm looking for things. Are they operating in really tight spaces? Are they uh, physically up to it? Are they are they mentally up to it? Are they a head case? You could watch Urian Timber um, at Ajax, and you could see that this dude is cold as the other side of the pillow, um, and just so quick so quick with the ball at his feet and so natural and that's the type of thing that you really feel like that can that can go to the next league cody gakpo is a, a, a great example of kind of the opposite in the in the Eredivisie, he was one of the leading dribblers uh in terms of like number and percentage but if you would watch him play uh at psv i don't think you would come away thinking that uh, this guy's going to go to the Premier League and he's going to be the next Alan Samaximin because he's going to get tons of dribbles. He's not going to be a Dama Traore. It's not the same guy. So I guess I, guess I that's where I'm com- coming with the, the eye test and the stats. Yeah. Okay, so you, you, you inevitably blend it a little bit. So it's not... Mm-hmm. And, and I only bring that up because I do think there is a large portion of the fan base that thinks it's black and white with somebody that uses stats. They jump to that, yeah. right? Like I'm like, oh my god, get off the, you know, get off the spreadsheet, kind of thing. And I so- watch a game with my eyes, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, why not watch it with everything? You know, the, the more information, the better. But uh, you know, in uh, had a few questions that I, you know, that I kind of gotten us started with uh, in my agenda for this, and then I, as we keep talking, I keep coming up with new and new ones because I just, I, again, I find this whole world so fascinating. We've got some great questions from the chat. So we're gonna I'm gonna ask my next question, then we're gonna go to the questions from the chat. And then as we've been doing, we'll try to leave about 15 minutes at the end for my four questions of you. Um uh, and uh and, and the prize draw before we get to the uh to the next segment. Um and actually there was a whole segment I wanted to do about kind of explaining what certain stats uh were and meant, but I'll I'll hold back on that. Um is there it are 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 our advanced stats ever predictive in nature in and of themselves uh and and, and i'm getting at the gambling thing but uh, a lot they, of money watch out they, I'm, kidding. I, I'm, I'm not asking like can i go and make a bunch of money off of this i'm just g- generically saying like do people attempt to utilize these stats 
to try to gain an advantage in, 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 in what may be a, um, what's it called, a uh, inefficient market where more information helps you actually beat the market on things? Or are they simply and just totally about explaining what has already happened more than they are about predicting what will happen in the future? So I think absolutely yes to both of those. So it is uh, something that, it, and it's uh, compared to what? So like if you're kind of thinking about, you know, we're, we're four games into the new season. And if you're trying to take these four games and predict out um, the worst one, I mean, you know, not necessarily the worst, but one of the ones that would work the least right now would be like thinking about just pure points. Um, that's not necessarily a great way to do like points earned right now is not going to be a great predictor of points into the future. Um, so a better one would be just looking at goals, right? Um, teams that are good score a lot of goals and, uh, you know, allow fewer goals. Um, and then even going a step further, you know, a better predictor of points into the future is expected goals. Um, when you start getting into like that eight to 12 match sample size, um, expected goals really start becoming a very good predictor of future results. Um, that's going to give you something. Um, it's going to balance out some of the the luck. You know, it's kind of a, a weird thing to say, but it's like the, the variability that happens inside of the game. Um, one of the things that I found um, and other research has shown that it's actually like a combination of goals and expected goals um, is a really good predictor of future because goals are obviously important. Um, and that's something that uh, player, you know, the teams are actually trying to do. And that's like towards the goal of winning. Um, you're trying to score goals. You're not trying to accumulate expected goals. Um, so uh, that is a, a, a very important thing for being able to, um, you know, be able to give a signal. There's, uh, you know, game state type thing. So if a team is an underdog and they score in the first minute, um, yeah, that's never happened to Arsenal, right? Um, where yeah. we've given up a goal in the first minute, but that's going to change the way that they play. So being able to have those kind of uh, things inside of your models is important. Um, so I think that is the the question is like, what are you trying to predict with the stats? Um, because there are certain ones that are going to give you a better sense of what's going to happen in the future. And then there are some that are just purely descriptive. Um, this is, you know, actually what happened. You know, a team had 12 shots in this match. Like that, that is what happened. And 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 on XG and 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 I'm not gonna I, I was gonna ask you about um uh there's like a there's like a PSG version of one there's like <laughs> P, PSXG and and um and and that was from Paris and then there's like I think Ramsdale's last in that um but rather than do all that just let's start with let's start with the basic one XG um I understand the concept uh, based on the way that the game went. You take out the luck. Uh, I, I can say with pretty good certainty, despite not knowing that much about advanced stats, that you know when when uh, Kai Havertz had the ball pretty much at the spot uh, with time and space, uh, that would be considered to be something that should have been a goal. Uh, and so I'm thinking that probably would have raised XG to a point where the actual score being lower than that shows that you know there was a chance missed. But who determines the value of the opportunities? Again, it's what it's kind of I, I keep going to the same place. Like, like, how is that determined the value of the opportunity that that because it's really not about whether he made it or not, it's about whether he should have made it or not, right? You want to take this one, Adam? <laughs> that's a that's a Scott threw this answer to me because that's a multi-tiered answer. So the XG and you're the, is smart, and you're the smart one of the duo. So so we got the <laughs> yeah. I'm the smart one. Scott's the wife guy. Uh, <laughs> I mean, I'm a wife guy too, to be fair. But no, so XG is built off of all the data that's been collected uh, previously. So when Kai Havertz is taking a shot from spot X on the pitch, what basically what these models are doing is taking all of the opportunities that have occurred from the same spot and using that to estimate what the typical odds of scoring are. So if, uh, if, if 99 guys have scored from one spot out of 100 chances historically, that should be 0.99 XG basically, right? Scott, step in if I'm saying something stupid. But Does it matter whether, there was a whether there's a defender closing in on him or whether he's completely wide open? With XG, it doesn't, no. But, the, but then we've gone... We, we have gone beyond XG in some other basic uh, or some not completely non-basic ways. So there is post shot XG, which is the one that you're talking about. So what that's doing is that will add in uh, the, the type, the shot 
like the what's the word I'm going for, Scott? Like the, uh, where um, on the frame it happens. At, yeah. So, and that will add another element of data to the to the discussion. <laughs> and then, uh, and then there's also another one where it's only comparing it to if that was a shot on target, what would the XG be? And that's post shot on target XG. I there's I Scott. I don't know. Save and me. what is that called? Is it <laughs> <laughs> So, so the way that I, you know, like to like to talk to people about XG is that we all kind of have an intuitive XG um, just from watching the game. Um, we know what a good chance is. We know what uh, a speculative chance is. Um, you know, we've all seen, you know, like we, we, you know, cover our eyes when somebody takes a shot from 30 yards because, you know, that's not a, a likely chance to be scoring. Um, you know, when a, a guy has a, a tap in from three yards out, that's a really good chance. So we have an intuitive sense of what good chances or bad chances are. Um, XG is just putting it in a more formalized way of what the you know the historical averages for similar chances are and you know not every you know even a single chance is always going to be unique um so these are estimates these aren't you know pure ratings of anything like that um but it is you know a, an informed from historical data what the averages are for each of these shots with the similar characteristics i mean it, it's fascinating it's really i mean it, I, I do i see the value and yet just don't think that I, I'm going to let you guys continue to be the uh, the leaders in the uh, dissemination and explanation and um, and and article articleification of these uh, of, of these things. So your your All words your business is not under threat from me. I just want to tell you, I've I've put a lot of people out of business in a lot of different industries. Um, you know, none of them podcasting, but uh, but but. <laughs> Math and maths ain't one of them. Hey, no, I no, I love me some math. It's it's just the I don't know. It's hard to explain, but math, you know, people who love math like I do aren't always good at statistics, um, because it's really more about how you think about things. Like I was awful with the standard deviation bullshit, um, but I I mean I could I could do math equations and algebra and stuff like you know like no one's business. But I mean when it comes into comes into the other stuff, I just I, I, I lose it. But um, we got some really, really good user questions. We have some very engaged people in the chat right now, um, and they're engaged with you guys. Uh, I know you're both wife people, but 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 these these people are engaged with you. Um, yeah, I'm married. Yeah. Married. So uh, well, so so is Seth. But uh, uh, we're going to see a, a couple of questions from Seth. Question: Why do we see such a variety in XG and and AXG? Are these subjective numbers? Uh, tell me if we've kind of already covered the the you know, through, through our previous questions, what he's trying to get at here. Um, so I think that there is a, a variety because there's, there's always different models. So there isn't one uh, overriding XG model. So, um, you know, my model is going to be different um, than anybody else. So I'll have different weighting on anything. Um, there's different data sources, like we just talked about. So there's the, you know, if you looked at Opta's data source, or if you looked at StatsBomb's uh, data sources, or even Scout's data sources, they're all going to have slightly different, um, ways that they, they measure things, which is always a, a little bit weird, but it's uh, you're measuring things um, from video. So it's not always the, the easiest, perfect thing to be able to do. But I think the biggest change is going to be just the different weighting um, for being able to do it. So my model, I have, it's actually five different models that are then were worked. So it depends on the situation. So I have one for uh, shots from feet from open play or from regular play. I have uh, shots from head from regular play. I have ones that are free kicks. Um, I have ones that are from set plays. So you're looking at all of these different things and then being able to model them differently um, on the different uh, characteristics of each of the shots. So it's going to be slightly different um, for what each uh, modeler uh, matters and cares for. Perfect. Um, I don't mean to be rude. I'm just I'm just texting Alan Smith about something real quick. No worries. Oh, yeah, you're, you're, just, you're just bigging up at us. Yeah, so yeah you know, then... typical stuff that people do all the time, really. Yeah, <laughs> text yeah. Alan Smith casually. I'll, yeah, here, no, I'll, I'll, just I'll, I'll include the next one, Mike, as you as you text Alan Smith and other various legends of the club, as you casually do. Adam, I'll go back to you if you would like. Do you do you wait? Did you? Ten, I'm on the podcast. I told yeah. you not to call me this uh, today. <laughs> Uh, you know, Mike, it's funny that you started these ones, so I don't know if you're taking the piss with this one or not. But Adam, do do United stink? 
please keep the answer as long and as elaborate <laughs> as possible. I don't even, I'm assuming you're taking the piss with this one, Mike. That's great. <laughs> I mean, I thought it'd be funny to answer. Um, oh. Just don't make it as long and elaborate as possible. But let, let, let me rephrase that. Do their, yeah, I think do their statistics lead to any sign of them, you know, that, that they're underperforming their, their, their potential and that they'll actually get things right this season? I don't think that I've seen anything in the first four games that makes me especially worried about them. Uh, I think, you know, looking at a lot of their, a lot of their uh, creative creativity statistics, I mean, they created a lot against Spurs and they didn't really accomplish anything from that. So, uh, you know, I, the best, I think that the best measurement that I have is what they did against Arsenal, which was basically next to nothing. Um, I mean, that's the simplest way I can think to put that. Okay, I know that was a little bit of was a banter one, and uh, Mike, Mike, Mike is texting Burkamp now at this point. So uh, I'll, I'll kick the ball back to you, Scott. And it, here's here's an interesting one because it, it's kind of it's I like the sense because I, I get to know where you guys are coming from with all this. And it's, here's a question for both of you, Scott. You get it, get the bite of the apple first. Do you have a stat based background outside of the Arsenal? Peter himself is a huge big nerd slash geek for analytics outside of football. Um, so I went to yeah, that, that was all my he schooling. A, he has a great avatar. I just had to I just had to put that in there. Sorry. Yeah. So for for school, um, I, I my my undergrad degree and my master's degree are both in economics. Um, so lots of uh, stats type work there. Um, you know, econometrics and being able to to do that. So that was where a lot of my uh, you know my stuff comes from in my actual day job. Uh, I don't get to do as much of it. I get to do boring kind of Excel stuff and create lots of PowerPoints. So don't get to do it in my, my day job quite as much. So this is stuff that uh, tickles my intellectual fancy. Very nice. How about and you, Adam? Adam? I'm, I'm more like Mike. Um, I was good at math in high school. Uh, I probably should have had some sort of math, uh, you know, major in college or university, depending on where you're watching this from. Um, but I, uh, no, I just, I went into English to be a writer, um, was a journalist for a while. Uh, I've been keeping stats notebooks since I was a kid though. And, um, you know, just always interested in understanding what I'm watching. So, uh, I don't know. It's always been one of my ways that I connect with the game, whichever game I happen to be into at the time. And you said you guys linked up basically by, I mean, Adam, you discovering what Scott was already doing and 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 reading his stuff and and uh, how did you, uh, you know, apply for uh, for friendship? <laughs> I think I reached out to, to to Adam and seeing if he'd be interested because I know I think you, you didn't really have like a, a great home for a lot of the stuff that you were doing, um, but I I really really liked all the stuff that you were posting. Um, and I thought that it would, you know, just really kind of dovetail nicely with what I was doing. So yeah, I was very, very excited. So I think that at least that's how I remember it. Yeah, no, that's, there were, I mean, Scott had to really like sweeten the deal, but that's how it happened. Uh, no, I, from, from my early days on Arsenal Twitter, I, I would follow Scott's stuff. I would follow the crab stats and, uh, you know, I always kind of looked at him as kind of like a, like an OG and inspiration along with. You know, Orbino, although I'm blocked by him now. Um, so, uh, you know, when How Scott, do you get blocked by Orbino? Were you criticizing him? I've never questioning heard questioning the almighty Orbino's asked. methods and his takeaways from his, his numbers. That's yeah, how that'll you get do it. Number of people Orbino. don't like being challenged on numbers, I guess. But, uh, but uh, so when did, uh, when did you stop being, oh, that crab, by the way? Um, I, I just, you know, it was a, a weird one where that went back to, uh, so I, I grew up uh, in the San Francisco Bay Area, um, you know, a Giants uh, baseball team fan, um, and they had a, a mascot called the the Crazy Crabber, um, which was back in the, the, like the late 80s, and he was an anti-mascot. He was a mascot that you were supposed to hate, um, but that made him almost a, a cult hero. Yeah. um so heel. Uh, i love that yeah um so this, this so this is back when the team was absolute uh bottom basement horrible team so they were trying to like make it so like they didn't you know you stopped hating the team and you hated the mascot so it was a perfect uh right. marketing thing from this team awesome. um so that's where i i took the original um kind of you know the crab inspiration from um, you know, I used to, to write about the, the giants and, um, but then I decided, you know, I wanted to be more professional. So, but with my, my name, with the switch. 
beautiful well and 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 scott j willis is much more professional so um tony rosandes who's been uh, uh both funny and asking really good questions um which is the the lethal combination uh says if there's one stat that you wish the general public understood better which one would it be is it uh ef 257 xxga a1 which which tells us that yeah, fabio vieira is a 100 million pound player i don't know there there are a lot i don't know if i don't know if there are any statistics i wish that people just understood but um you know i think i think i just i a lot of times i'm running more into the application of statistics and the understanding of what they mean um, you know, I, I like, I, I think a good example is anytime I see anybody cite pass completion percentage, I'm like, so like, who cares? I do not care. How many, how many passes did they complete during the game? I do not care. Uh, so just, just really looking at more like what, what do the stats mean, uh, is something that I wish we had a little bit more of, um, you know, I post a lot about, uh, center back stats in particular and i say that i you know the center back stats of the devil and i don't dance with the devil um and i think that a lot of people misuse those stats too yeah i think i would uh, echo that i think it is less that there's one stat that people use wrong um it's a lot more about the understanding of the context of what they mean um i think defensive stats are probably the the biggest one i think we have a, a in, in the stats community i think there's a better understanding of attacking metrics because the the incentives for attacking metrics line up a lot better with what you're actually measuring um because the the goal of an attack is to try to score goals so you know that flows backwards right you're trying to you know create shots you're trying to create good quality shots you're trying to get passes into dangerous locations and those are things that are really easy for us to measure and we understand the intent uh, with defensive actions, you're trying to prevent something to happen. And that isn't always something that aligns with the, the event data that we have. You're trying to um, sometimes measure the absence of something. And that isn't always um, going to be lining up with, um, you know, doing a tackle, right? You know, there's the, I think the, the classic line that it's like, if I made a tackle, that means I made a mistake. And I think that is a, a very good truism, right? It can be positioning. It can be uh, cutting out a passing lane to make it so that dangerous pass didn't happen. But how do you measure something that didn't happen? And I think that's something that is that people could probably do a little bit better to understand some of the context around, um, you know, the limitations of the stats. Yeah. Mike, can I bring that last question in from 312 Gunnar up? Yeah, yeah. I'm actually curious because and it kind of relates to the Shaka slash Havers conversation that we're having because – we're comparing a full full league to four games. Q from 312 Gunner. When do stats cross the line from small sample size to enough to draw conclusion from? Or does it depend on the stat? Yeah. I don't know. Adam, where's your kind of your your baseline of where you like to to try to start looking at things? I think I think I've noticed that Scott and I are around the same on this. So hopefully he's not gonna shake his head at me here. But <laughs> usually, usually I will not chart anyone on any of my templates if they haven't played at least 900 minutes. Uh, that's kind of so. That's ten. Like that's ten that. full games, and that's uh, that's what I feel is about good. I mean, if you're looking for like broad conclusions, I think that there are there are some stats that you need a lot more than that. Um, you know, like uh, we're talking about Ramsdale post shot expected goals versus his goals. Um, you know, with keepers, I think you need multiple seasons. Finisher finishing stats, I think you need multiple seasons. But um, you know, short answer made long. 900 minutes yeah and and there's i think there's part of it is that we don't always have that luxury of being able to wait for the samples to become uh yeah. the size that we would like to be able to do so you sometimes have to uh try to squeeze as much out of that lemon that you can and you just got to make as much lemonade as you even if it's the less than ideal um, but that's again going back to understanding the context and understanding the limitations so um, sometimes you have to make those small sample size things but then your conclusions need to match that where you can't be quite as strong with your decisions that you're being able to draw from those. Okay, perfect. Um, and and um, we are, uh, you know, the uh, the conversation went, I got so deep into the conversation, I, I lost track of time. I know we can, I we can do to... another hour at least, but yeah. No, but... Well, you know, we can. And that's the good thing about the pot -a -thon is that, you know, while we're getting 50 different guests on in 25, you know, 25 different segments, we now have a platform upon which we can have you back on again another time. I mean, we, uh, you know, our podcast is in its 
in its uh, height of, of what we're able to do is both game recaps and banter fest, but also talking about, you know, what I prefer doing actually is talking about interesting topics uh, that, you know, are a little bit off the beaten path of, of exactly just what happened last week. So um, we're going to get back to that. I keep saying that, but I promise we're going to get back to that and we'll, ha- you know, we'll definitely have you guys on again. Um, I got to get your answers to the four questions and we, and, um, and because we're running up against the end of the hour, um, let's go through these. Uh, the four questions are, uh, your top six in no particular order, uh, your Belanda or winner, your expected first coach to get sacked, uh, in the Premier League, and then some kind of wacky out of the, uh, out of the normal realm prediction for world football this year. Uh, and we'll go to Scott first for his, his top six. All right, my top six. So um, I think that there's a, a relatively easy three or four to pick. Um, so I think Manchester City, Arsenal, and I think Liverpool. Um, so I think those are three that are really easy to pick. After that, I think it becomes a lot harder. Um, I, I think I'm going to say uh, Chelsea, uh, United, Brighton. All right, I, I'm I'm losing my 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 very favorite team, Spurs. I, oh, I, yes. I couldn't I couldn't include know. them. Uh, as as I've you know personally witnessed, I can tell you, uh, Ballon d'Or winner. Uh, I think uh, I think it's gonna go with Messi. All right, first coach to get sacked. I think it's gonna be Eddie Howe. He's yeah, that was another team, right? That I, I didn't include I Newcastle like in my top six. Um, so I, I think that's a certain possibility. I think they're going to have uh, a real struggle to deal with the, that group of death that they have in the Champions League. Um, I think that teams are going to start to understand that you just give them the ball. And I think that's going to make it a lot harder for them to be able to create the same kind of chances they had last year. And I think the expectations for them are going to be uh, really, really high this year. And, and bef- you know, before those games start stacking up is when they needed to start, you know, collecting points. And they have, uh, other than the very first game that they played, they've not exactly done that. Um, your out of left field prediction for the year in world football. Oof. This, this is this is not a an easy one here. Um, I, I, Arsenal are going to win the Champions League. <laughs> okay. Um, all right, Adam. Same questions. Top yeah, six? top top six. Uh, Manchester City, Arsenal third place i'm going to go with it could be in any order by the way okay so manchester city arsenal i think newcastle will get into the final top six i think that manchester united get in there and i think that in sixth place i'll go preseason i predicted the ninth i'll take big Ange's spurs all right and that's five teams You're trying to steal my that. spurs mojo that's only five okay put throw brighton in there all right I will do that. Um, you are Ballon d'Or winner. Going to be Leo Messi. All right. First, first coach to get sacked. First coach to get sacked. Uh, I think I think Eddie Howe is going to hang in there. Um, so I'm trying to think of who the next guy under real pressure would be. I think all the guys that are on the hot seat are doing pretty well. Preseason, I might have said Moyes, but he's doing good. Paul Hecking bottom. All right, Sheffield uh, Sheffield United. Was it intentional for you to not pick Liverpool in the top six? No. <laughs> it's too late now. Sorry. I forgot. I, I, forgot, I, I forgot Brighton existed when I answered, so I feel your pain right now. You do, I, you do not get a do-over. Um, I forgot. I would, for the record, I would have put them top six, but not third like Scott. Okay. Um, because you're going to put them second. Can we you can, do the thing, Mike, where you ask me at every top of the hour that I'm on in occasion if if I eventually hit it right, just clip that one of me being right. I would oh like, yeah, yeah, we can. I do like that to try right. this about seven times. I, I think I think I did that before the uh, Fulham game about like how many goals uh, Kai Havertz was going to get, and I had like zero, one, two, three, four, and five, and I and then I deleted the the all but the zero one. After. I love that. Um, I mean, and and I don't care that people saw that. I mean, that's not the point. I'm not trying to fool anyone. Um, and your out of left field prediction? I think uh, I think Bayer Leverkusen are going to finish second in the Bundesliga. Okay, big Granit Xhaka. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, all right. Um, 
We've got a nice comment from Ovid, who's uh, who's up late tonight. Good to see you, Ovid. Um, love what you both do. We're not going to ask the we're not going to ask the questions, unfortunately, because we're we're up at the end here. Um, but uh, but I, I I wanted to say thanks to both of you. We're going to actually pick the uh, pick the winner of this of, of this prize draw. Um, th this prize draw is a piece of art from Ruth Beck Art. For those of you who didn't see the ones I held up before, uh, Ruth does scenes of uh, of Highbury and Emirates and Arsenal players and such. And we've got some some very cool looking artwork. And this is an A three size print, which which makes for a nice size print for your walls. Um, and the winner we will draw in just a second. Uh, where's the randomizer? Here it is. Just let me know when, Mike. All right, hold on. Uh, starting to feel a bit of fatigue coming in. So when I'm doing these high tech things like like sharing screens, it's it's getting a little tougher here. All right, so we're gonna we're gonna do a draw here for the Ruth Beck art. Oh, I got a line. I got to sign in to this mofo. Um. Here we go. Choose the drawings. I'm pulling back the, the curtain here. We're doing a GUID randomization. And the result is that the Ruth Beck art winner is Brock Werner. Brock has won a piece of his choice of Ruth Beck art. Thank you, Brock. Brock comes to us from Chicago, Illinois. So uh, congratulations, Brock. Thank you for your donation. Thank you, everybody, for your donation. It's been uh, it's been unbelievable so far. We're over the ten thousand dollar mark for the potathon. We're over the twenty five thousand dollar mark for this year's campaign, uh, and we are well over the hundred thousand dollar mark for uh, for Gunners versus Cancer. So um, now, tell us where we can find you online. I've got uh, I've got a few of your uh, handles up here. Make sure that I've got them right. Um, yeah. But uh, these are these are Twitter handles for for yeah. for Scott, for Adam, for Canon Stats, and of course CanonStats.com. You guys have a uh, a Substack, is that correct? That's correct. That is correct. Yes. And that does what for you? Yeah. So you get you get all sorts of it's a good stuff, right? So we uh, we got our, our weekly podcast um, that we've uh, really started to to make it an actual weekly thing, and I think that's been going really well. Um, yeah, you'll get uh, post game stuff from from me. Adam has been uh, killing it lately with his uh, players to watch and uh, you know doing the all around scouting. So um, you'll you'll get lots of uh, good content. I think it's at least three to four articles a week from us right now. So very very good stuff. Beautiful. All right. Well, thank you so much. I know that the uh, this is actually one of the hours that had uh, some really really good, as I said before, engagement with the chat. Despite it being, you know, five to six a.m. in in, in uh, Western Europe, one a.m. here on the East Coast. Thank you so much for staying up late, uh, being with us, and uh, and good luck to you guys in the future. And I will see hopefully both of you, but uh, but definitely uh, Scott. You know that there'll be another another hang. Uh, we'll we'll go to Big Red after the other bars <laughs> close, which Absolutely. was the biggest revelation that came out of that last trip over. Um, and, uh, and we'll have a good time. So thanks. A thanks a bunch for joining us. I appreciate it. I guess. Thanks right, guys. Bye, guys. Hey Gooners. This is Alan Smith. This is Kevin Campbell. Lee Dixon. It's Colin Lewin. It's Gary Lewin. Charles Watts. Dan Potts. James Benj. Stanley. Tom from the Gooners Talk here. Ryan Oakhurst. Simon Collins. You may know me from the Evening Standard. You may know me from my time at Arsenal. You may know me from Arsenal or even the Hybrid Squad. I'm a bird cat one's land. Being that physio set on the bench next to Arson with my rubber gloves on. The former Arsenal physio. The Emirates press box from writing, from Twitter. From goal.com, from Twitter, from YouTube. Football is the beautiful game and it brings us all together. Sometimes there are things even more important than wins and losses. And yes, even transfers. Every 30 seconds someone in this world gets diagnosed with blood cancer. The Leukaemia and Lymphoma Society works towards curing blood cancers and provide support to families currently dealing with these diseases. Gunas vs Cancer was started in 2017 by a lifelong Guna who lost his father to leukaemia way too young. Since 2017, Gunas v Cancer has raised over $75,000 for the Leukaemia and Lymphoma Society. 
and we need your help to keep the fundraising going in this year's campaign. Every donation helps. Every donation helps. Every donation helps. Every donation helps. No matter the size. And every donation enters you into the Guna raffle. Well, you have a great chance to win amazing Arsenal prizes, including game tickets, stadium tours, signed men and women's shirts. And maybe a retro signed shirt by yours truly, Lee Dixon. Me, yours truly. Yours truly. Super kick out. So much more. It's easy to take part. Just go to www.gunasvcancer.com and donate directly to the charity. Pick the raffle prizes you want to enter to win and wait for the drawings at the end of the campaign. Again, that's www.gunasvcancer.com. We all know that victory grows out of harmony. Victory grows out of harmony. Victory grows out of harmony. With your help, we'll be victorious against blood cancer once and for all. Thank you for your support. Thank you for your support. Thank you for your support. Thanks for your support. Thanks for your support. Thank you for your support.